this sweetener could be seriously problematic. It could be linked to heart disease. It could be linked to stroke. And when these kinds of claims are made, like this study that was published just a couple of weeks ago, like the world stops because we should look at this kind of thing. We're talking about xylitol. Xylitol is a sweetener that's used in tons of things, like tons of things. It's like in the same category, almost like erythritol. Like we see it in gums, we see it in a lot of packaged foods, we see it in, it's a sweetener, it's used in baking even, it's common. So this study suggests, I mean, it beyond suggests, it makes a pretty strong claim that high xylitol levels, basically meaning people that consume large amounts of xylitol, are a huge risk when it comes down to heart disease and stroke. So let's unpack what this study talked about. Now, after today's video, I put a link down below for Element Electrolytes. They are a sponsor on this channel, and I recommend you check them out if you wanna enjoy an electrolyte beverage that tastes good, doesn't have calories, and they also have a sparkling version now that is in a can, which is pretty cool. So I put that link down below. It's drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. It's sweetened with stevia, not with xylitol, and it has 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium, so perfect to sip on during a workout or when you're just trying to sip on something that doesn't have calories that can help replenish electrolytes. So that link is down below. So do you remember last year, there was this study that took a look at erythritol, which is another sweetener, and it found that erythritol was linked to major adverse cardiac events, and it was linked to heart attack and stroke and blood clotting. It was a very big deal. In fact, I ended up doing a video on that one, and I had a couple of doctors come on and talk about it as well. Except the one thing that we found with that erythritol study was that it was what's called reverse causation. Like the erythritol study, it held no weight. Basically, the body produces erythritol when you are metabolically unhealthy, to be completely honest. And they were basically piggybacking studies on top of each other to try to make this claim, and it was a moot point. Guess what? Turns out, this study, this xylitol study, was produced by the same research group that put out that extremely flawed erythritol study in February of 2023. Okay, so my sort of spidey senses kind of went off when I saw that in the first place. So let's take a deeper dive into this study. So the first thing that I noticed was that this study was extremely, extremely, almost identical, like cut and paste methods that we saw in the erythritol study. It was like the exact same kind of setup. They had one arm of the study that looked at people that had high levels of xylitol in their blood. And then they had a separate arm of the study, which was sort of a dodgy in vitro type paper, where they looked at like how the xylitol would impact uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma. Okay, so well, let's still take a look at this because I'm intrigued. The main takeaway from this was that they found that when they looked at over 2,100 people over a three-year follow-up, they found that the higher the levels of xylitol in the blood, the higher the risk of heart attack and stroke. As a matter of fact, high levels of xylitol were associated with about a 57% increased risk of major adverse cardiac events compared to those the lowest levels of xylitol in their blood. If I saw that, I would stop and I would consider things for a minute. Except there's a huge, huge glaring problem here. And it, it preys on the fact that people don't necessarily know that xylitol is also produced in the body. So xylitol is part of what is called GMP. It's a pathway to produce something called xylose. So people don't realize that we produce xylitol in the body. And what we realized last year with this erythritol paper was that erythritol is also produced in the body and it's generally produced when people are in metabolic distress and at high risk of cardiac events to begin with. Now, so we know that xylitol is produced in the body. So how do we not know that these people just have high levels of xylitol because they have high levels of naturally produced xylitol? Like what's to say that these people were actually consuming xylitol or not? Well, when we actually understand how xylitol, when consumed, is processed in the body, it makes things a little bit more clear. When you consume xylitol, like you chew some xylitol gum, it's probably out of your body in about two hours. It goes in and out very fast. That is not long enough to really raise long-term xylitol levels. So if you were measuring someone that chewed xylitol gum, you'd have to measure them 
within like an hour or so of consuming that gum to have elevated xylitol levels. Xylitol is cleared very fast. The only logical reason as to why someone would have high levels of xylitol in their blood would be because they are producing a lot, which begs the question, well, why are we producing so much xylitol? So that does open up a new can of worms. Like maybe if we have high levels of xylitol, maybe if the bodies are going into overdrive of producing xylose via this microorganism sort of metabolite pathway, well then maybe, maybe that's something we should investigate. But it doesn't mean that consuming xylitol is driving that. Now in a moment, I'm gonna have Dr. Tommy Wood give his words on this. Dr. Tommy Wood is a very well-established physician and the guy is awesome. He's like my go-to when I need something additionally vetted. So I'm gonna have him sort of give his insight on this as well. But let's talk about the other side of this study for a second because they had an in vitro arm where then in a Petri dish, they took human plasma and they treated it with xylitol. And they saw that when they treated it with xylitol in ridiculously high amounts, it increased platelet aggregation and activation, which is sort of the beginning stages of clotting. So it's like, okay, xylitol in a Petri dish with PRP is going to start to clot. That's not good. Oh wait, we have this other piece over here that shows that people that have high risk of stroke and heart disease have high levels of xylitol. Let's go ahead and let's connect these together and scare everybody for something that makes no sense and has, so what they did not do is take people that consume high amounts of xylitol and do a study on that. This is basically like saying, hey, these people over here have diabetes and they have high blood sugar. And in this Petri dish, when we get, put sugar in this Petri dish, glucose spikes. So if you ever spike your glucose or if you ever eat sugar, you have diabetes. That's, it's the same kind of concept. It makes no sense whatsoever. It makes sense to actually a lot of people that don't have the foundational understanding of things, which is exactly what the goal is, to scare, to keep people coming back for more, to alarm people, possibly maybe even some money situation involved there, who knows. I'm gonna let Dr. Tommy Wood take a little stab at this and explain in his more medical experience what he notices with this paper. Hello everybody, Tommy Wood here with some thoughts on this latest xylitol study. It's actually a carbon copy of a study by the same group that looked at erythritol um, with this, for the same risks of cardiovascular disease and clotting uh, that was published last year. Um, but what they did here is they looked at blood samples of two different groups, looked at xylitol levels and found that if you grouped people into thirds or tertials of xylitol level, those with the highest xylitol levels had the highest risks of cardiovascular disease or major adverse cardiovascular events in the next few years. They then um, gave some xylitol, a high dose of xylitol to some participants, 30 grams. Um, they saw how high that raised xylitol levels in the blood. Then they also uh, took blood from those participants, uh, took the plasma and stimulated it to try and create um, a, a scenario that, that, that involves clotting, uh, clotting the blood. They saw that if you had xylitol in the blood, when they did that, they sort of gave these stimulating factors. They saw more clotting when xylitol was present. And then finally, they did a, a mouse study where they actually injected mice with xylitol and saw that they also had a higher risk of clotting. Each of these steps has certain issues that kind of moderate some of the concern that you'd see from this study. So in the, in the first is that circulating xylitol levels in people, they did look at thousands of people, um, but the amount of xylitol that you have circulating in your blood, generally, unless you've just eaten, and these were uh, fasted samples, so generally the amount of xylitol that's circulating in your blood is xylitol that you made yourself. Uh, and most uh, people make, they think, make something like five to 15 grams of xylitol a day. Xylitol is made from glucose through the uh, glucuronate pathway, and this pathway is upregulated in those who have insulin resistance and metabolic disease, uh, potentially because the cell is trying to get rid of excess glucose by shuttling it through this pathway, and xylitol is one of the things that's being produced. So circulating xylitol is probably a marker 
of metabolic disease more than it is a risk factor in its own right. Right. So maybe it's a useful biomarker for people at high risk, but that's because it's telling you about metabolic disease rather than telling you about xylitol in the diet. The next uh, potential issue is the dose that they gave to participants. They gave 30 grams. Uh, that's a pretty big dose, although certainly possible to eat that much. Uh, interestingly, when um, other people have looked at xylitol and how much is absorbed, if you give a lower dose, um, like seven grams was tested in one study, that doesn't get absorbed at all. And that's a more a more typical dose, I would say, from people who are uh, consuming foods that contain xylitol. So for more regular, um, occasional consumption of xylitol, there doesn't seem to be any uh, that's absorbed. Um, and that's probably more relevant to people. And then finally, uh, in uh, the mouse study, it was interesting that when they gave xylitol uh, orally, the mice didn't absorb it at all either. So they had to inject it into the abdominal cavity in order for it to get uh, absorbed. And there's a number of issues with a lot of uh, rodent studies. They don't necessarily tell us a lot about humans. So I'm a little bit less concerned about that mouse study um, in particular. So overall, uh, I think the particularly as, as it pertains to the risk of cardiovascular events, I think the xylitol in your blood is telling you something about your metabolic health uh, and uh, you know, more so than it's telling you about xylitol in the diet and how that can affect um, uh, cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, equally, when they looked at clotting in these blood samples, they had to really try hard to get that, that blood to clot. And again, that's just not really physiological. It's not relevant to most people. So this is probably not something that uh, should be uh, of concern uh, to most individuals. I think you know we, we do have to say we can't discount these results completely, maybe in those who consume very large amounts of xylitol who are at very high risk for cardiovascular disease because of other risk factors, you know, they're, they're very likely to, to clot because again of, of similar risk factors like metabolic disease. Um, you know, maybe in, in those individuals there, there could be an elevated risk. I, I don't think this paper really tells us that, but we can't discount that, uh, entirely. But I would say that for most people, um, who are in good metabolic health or improving their metabolic health, uh, with more normal small amounts of xylitol being consumed um, from foods, it's very unlikely that this is going to uh, increase risk, at least based on uh, historical data that we have from the literature, as well as this study, um, which uh, for those reasons, uh, you, I think probably doesn't, um, is, isn't relevant to, to most of us. I know some of that echoed what I already said, but it's nice to hear it from a medical expert, not just some dude on the internet. So it's pretty evident that with this study, the reason xylitol was elevated was from the endogenous production, not from the actual xylitol consumption itself. Interestingly enough, xylitol acts as sort of a sugar alcohol. There's actually benefits to consuming xylitol. Xylitol can be antimicrobial even. It can actually like feed on microbes that aren't exactly good and help clear them. Interestingly enough, like my doctor, Dr. Kyle Gillette, who's been on this channel, he's been on Andrew Huberman's channel, things like that. Like he has suggested that I consume xylitol when I have specific bacterial issues going on. And it's, I think that we are absolutely raining on something that is good. Like xylitol, in my opinion, is head and shoulders above aspartame, head and shoulders above sucralose. Okay, personally, I'm an allulose guy myself, but I still think that there's a lot that we can do with xylitol. Now, I can't imagine, maybe you can put in the comment section like what your thoughts are, like why we're trying to rain on xylitol so much. I can't possibly comprehend why we're coming after erythritol last year, and now we're coming after xylitol. Do we just wanna confuse people and make them resign to just consuming sugar? Like what's next? Because we even have, I, again, here's the thing. I'm not an aspartame guy. I'm not a sucralose guy. I'm not afraid of it in small amounts, but I definitely don't go out of my way to consume it. And I don't regularly consume it. Okay, but I even find it kind of interesting that we've been having papers coming out attacking those in interesting ways that are hard to really support. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, Thomas is like pro artificial sweetener. I'm not at all. I just kind of find it interesting that almost everything is just going back to, well, maybe we should just have sugar. It just seems a little bit odd. But at the end of the day, you need to be your own advocate. You need to look at this stuff and you need to go to people that you trust that can look at these studies and not just blindly follow whatever's being said. 
As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.